Hi, everybody. I'm Eugene Clark, your roving art reporter, and I am on the air live on Zoom with the incomparable, the magical, the majestic Matt Faulkner. Let's hear it, folks. Please, please, no. Hello, Professor. And How are you? He makes a great egg white omelet. I'm just saying. Well, I do like my egg white omelets with a little spinach in them. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Where are you? Are you? You're on the road. Are you out searching for you know, art again? I am. You're, you're never going to know where I will show up. Yeah. Uh, but I do have, you know, some snacks in the bag here to substance. Necessary. You know, the aqua pura. Beautiful. And uh, so, yeah. But I'm I'm searching around. Yeah. You uh, see, you see somebody out there drawing or painting. You you run right up to them and say, well, "What are you doing with that? What's going on there?" That kind That's of thing. Right. And I find I find out all about it, get all the background information, and then I give them a citation of goodness. Yeah. <laughs> a love drive-by. <laughs> That's right. Uh, right. Are there art drive-bys? I don't know, but we yeah. can start those. Yeah. We can. We can. So we'll. We're. Yeah. We're on that. <laughs> Who are we talking about today? Who's our hero today, Eugene? So we are going to speak about none other than the one, the only Romare. Bearden, Romare Bearden, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, we're going to talk about Romare Bearden, who is an American artist. And he grew up in New York City in the neighborhood of Harlem. And one special uh, part of his upbringing is that. Uh, it coincided with what we call the Harlem Renaissance, which just means that, you know, art was abundant, not just visually, but musically and, you mm. know, poetically, and it doesn't matter what it was, it was happening. So any of these prominent uh, African-American artists that were on the scene at the time, they would definitely make a stop in New York City in Harlem. I mean, you have to. And being that, Romare Bearden's parents were very instrumental in that time. They would literally invite artists to stay at their house. And the artists would, of course, kindly oblige and, and stay and hang out and influence this young Romare Bearden so much so that as he grew up, he became not only a visual artist, but a jazz composer. How do you like that? Jazz composer. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah, that's and, my you know, two cents worth. Uh, I'm I'm looking at his info. He was born in I think 1911, and lived to 1988. So um, I think the Renaissance was in the the Harlem Renaissance was in the 20s and the 30s. So he was a fairly young man when this was when he you know became involved in that. He really was. And I think that um, as you look at his work, you can see the influence of all of what was happening. Yeah. Um, just infiltrating, uh, not just the colors, the balance, composition, imagery. It's yeah. quite dazzling. Yeah. And I will show, uh, I'll share the screen in a second here but one other thing to to me about him is that the fact that he was both a musician and an artist um you know the whole idea that um uh it's that we have so much as kids nobody looks at a child and says uh well you're just an artist uh, that's all you can do so don't even think about picking up a guitar and <laughs> you know uh same, he, he kept that. He decided, you know, uh, from just from the work look and, and the fact that he was a, a jazz musician and a, and a, a writer uh, of music, you know, he basically said, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And I'm going to do all of yeah. it if I feel like it, by the way. So that's impressive. Yeah, what's, it's nice to see a person like Romare who doesn't pigeon, pigeonhole themselves into just one facet of creativity. So it makes sense. The music and the art was so abundant at the, the time of his childhood that he would just embrace all of it wholeheartedly 
Um, here's a really neat little tidbit uh, connected to Romare and his music. Um, the Marcellus family, Ellis Marcellus, the father, and then of course, Winton Marcellus, the great trumpeter, jazz and classical. And then uh, brother Branford Marcellus, uh, who plays saxophone. And he produced an album uh, a while back and it was completely dedicated to the art and music of Romare Bearden. Beautiful. Uh, I don't have the name of the album, but I do know that it exists. And I just love that connection. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, because I mean, to have him recognized by uh, that family who is the penultimate in uh, music um, is, is really important. Um, to celebrate the elders um, that way is is fantastic. So I want to let's 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 talk about his work. I'm going to share the screen here and get to this part and get rid of that. Okay. So here's the first image I have. So he uh, created collage. And um, seems like it was pretty prolific, Eugene. Created yes. a lot of this work. Or at least I, there, were, there weren't a lot of repeat images when I did his search. So um, <laughs> he, he stayed busy. Yeah, what's really interesting about looking at a piece like this and understanding the media of collage is that as you investigate his collage work, you know, it really becomes a mixed media piece because it isn't just based off of hand cut paper images or photographic images, but he does put paint and drawing mixed in there as well. Yeah. And then I would like to mention that at the Detroit Institute of Arts, uh, there is a mosaic uh, that is, you know, on permanent exhibit. Uh, which was completed by Ro one Romare Bearden. And when you, when you look at the mosaic media and you think of collage, uh, those are two uh, types of media that I think go hand in hand. Although one is paper and one usually is tile or glass. Uh, when, you, when you think about how you work with those materials and, and the, the way they look in the end, um, it makes total sense that he would gravitate towards mosaic. Um, and you see some of that happening right here as mm -hmm. we're looking at this work. Yeah. Um, it's the word lyrical comes up for me and just in terms of um, the stories that he's telling in the imagery, but also the way um, the content of each image that he uses to create the larger image. Um, if I want to look in there and try to see, okay, what is this thing that is the wood of the barn or of the house behind them? What is the, what are the images that he's using for that? And, and it doesn't appear to me to be all wood. So there's like a, um, it's really playful to, um, uh, to try to when I when I look at the macro, you know, the macrocosm, the the larger picture, and then go into the microcosm of all of the smaller smaller elements of it, um, there's a uh, just like a delightful. The guy is really giving himself the freedom to to do what he wants to do, which is really um, inspiring to me. You know, you don't see collage enough even today, and collage has been around for a long time, but at the time that Romare was doing it, uh, it was quite new. And he was one of the forerunners of the media. So I think, you know, when you study art history and you talk about collage and its inception, he's one of the first people that you're gonna go right to because he just has such an immense amount of work done in this style. Uh, but you have to believe that at this time, when people were looking at this work, it had to be quite startling 
Yeah. Because I don't think in the 1920s that we were looking at stuff. I'm thinking about like Art Nouveau as a style that took over everything from the yeah. interiors of architecture to to our uh, you know lamps and furniture and and tableware and clothing and and then at the same time you've got this stuff going on how amazing how interesting and what a tribute i think we could say knowing his background and knowing about um his you know influences by the harlem renaissance i mean this is quite a tribute to that yeah you know what and there's there is a there are things going on in here color wise that are really kind of fascinating to me um because of in some places the color choices the figures hold together the space holds together and then in other places it's because of the form so like when i see the form of the side of this house where this figure is in the window up there um it this edge helps me to know that whatever color this is is the probably maybe the deck or maybe it's the lawn but it's pink <laughs> <laughs> right? And yeah, I don't care. You know, in fact, it educates my eye. It forces my eye to say it's a possibility that there are things that my that I assume that I don't. And because I make the assumptions about things that I don't really see clearly that and that, in fact, something like that space could be pink and I have yeah. to accept it. It makes my eye accept things that I don't necessarily want to accept and I didn't even really notice that that was pink until I you know just now I'm, my eyes roaming around I'm like wait a minute that is that, that why is that pink I didn't care at first you know it, it it sat there properly yeah this is uh very playful um very immediate very much like a reaction to the material but yeah there are also other parts of it that feel well thought out in in its um whole you know from beginning to end in terms of you know the central focus is on these characters with this beautiful house behind uh, a house near them with the person looking out the window which i think almost brings a little bit more of an informal yeah feeling because you can picture these guys maybe they're just playing because they're they're enjoying the evening and either you have a person in the building who just wants to be part of it or as we know there could be someone who's like hey would you guys be quiet i'm trying to sleep <laughs> um one of my favorite parts of uh this piece is something that i feel is a little less dominant because it's in the background, but also because it kind of blends into the background is the train on the far left. Right. And if it wasn't for that little bit of smoke coming out, uh, I might even, you know, just based on looking at it on my small screen, I might, I might miss that. Yeah. And he's, you know, it's so gestural in the way that he is like, if you didn't have that smoke coming out of that train, is that a train? I'm not sure I would know what it was. I mean, eventually I'd say, okay, wait a minute, that looks like a smokestack. Um, but the the um, freedom he's given himself to, you know, describe these things in in the way that he is through the the cutting, he's not getting like really um, hyper uh, <clears throat> detailed with the the way he's trying to to actually show these uh, these forms, whether it's a train or a person. And, and that to me is exciting. Again, because it's yeah. making my eye put things together uh, that my eye is like, well, I, I'm just gonna say that's a train. I don't know for a fact, but I'm gonna say that it is. And I like that. That's the, that's the lyrical nature of it, is that it is allowing the, me, the viewer, to have fun um, playing with the imagery, you know? Oh um, yeah. The the other thing to me is like th this feels like cubism to me. Yeah. Um. I, now, so he's 
I, like I said, I think he was born in 11, 1911. So um, Cubism would have already been in full swing while he was uh, in, at his birth. But you know, to show the influence of that, um, the breaking down of the forms into um, these uh, basic shapes, um, and uh, and then okay, I, I also have to say this this hand right here is really fascinating to me too. Um, and then I think that these are carrots instead of fingers, and but <laughs> they read as they read as a hand. Um, I think it's kind of fascinating to me. I think that this might be a Caucasian hand on an African American uh, figure. And that's interesting to me too, that he just said, I don't care, it's a hand. I'm gonna stick it on there because it because that's what it's what I need there. Um, so and and at that time to have done this, you know, a hundred years ago, to take that kind of freedom is a big deal to me. Yeah, you know, as we break down the medium, which we know is primarily hand cut paper from a variety of sources, some of them photographic in nature, possibly magazines, things like that. Um, but we do know that in some of his works, he gets paint and he gets drawing in there. But for the most part, you know, when you're looking at this, it's truly a collage. But in some instances, I forget I'm looking at a collage and I think that I'm looking at a painting. Yeah. And I, I love it when artists can utilize materials in such a way that it fools with my perception of what I'm looking at. Yeah. Let's take a look at another one. Okay. Now, some of these, I was thinking like, okay, did he do these when he was 20 years old in the 1930s? But some of the photography that he's using, it looks newer. Like when I look at this window up here, that doesn't look like it's something from a National Geographic in 1920. I wonder if he's doing these from like ads, like maybe in the 1950s, you know what I'm saying? Sure. I, that yeah. would make sense to me. Yeah, I'm sure that, um, you know, the span of his art making, you know, went over decades. And so as the technology of printed material evolved, um, he had access, you know, to uh, work like you're recognizing that might resemble a particular time period. And uh, what's interesting in this piece compared to the first one is that you you do see quite a bit more photography integrated than we did in that other one. It was very minor. Um, where here, I feel like the photography is a bigger part, uh, especially in the faces where before he would cut a nose or an eye out from a source and bring that in and utilize more of uh you know, a piece of paper that either had a texture or a value to it or color. And here, it almost looks like he cut the face out of a photograph and brought it in the whole, the entire face. And yeah. so I find that fascinating to think um, how he works differently in that regard from piece to piece. Yeah. I really like to, th this figure right here, uh, uh, looks like a female uh, figure. And that the fact that the face in comparison to the, the whole of the, the head is, is oversized. And yeah. it reads, it, it has an emotional quality to me. It's telling me that um, to me, this is an important character like because of the scale. Um, and, and that's really interesting to me that he's doing this with uh, cut pieces of paper and uh, co you know, colored paper and photographs and so forth, that he's telling, he's, he's getting me as the viewer to look at different things. Um, and I, I'm, you know, I'm wondering, okay, is, he, is, there, is there a reason why this figure's face is, is so much bigger? Um, uh, same thing with this, uh, this 
um, conglomeration of different, I think the nose is different than the eyes, is different than the mouth, is different than the forehead. Um, and yeah, the, it, there's more of this going on in all of the different faces. They're put together, they're not just one face. So that's kind of fascinating to me that he's telling these stories. Again, I keep hear, hearing this word lyrical. Um, it, yeah, even like I'm hearing music, I wouldn't necessarily say that, but they feel like they feel like music to me, this work. Yeah, what I think we have to look at when you're referring to his work and the time that it was uh, being created, you know, we, we talked about an artist last week, Jackson Pollock, who produced a lot of the work that I know, th that I recognize is his work, you know, the splatter paintings. Um, he produced them a lot earlier than I had embedded in my mind. I thought that they were produced a little bit later, like in the 60s, and we found out that they were prior to the 60s. So this work is um, going to be some of it done around that time, some of it done even earlier. And, you know, you're, you're talking about modern art. You know, we're talking about pr uh, proportion going out the window when it comes to uh, trying to represent things. Um, I think it's interesting. He's using photographs, but, you know, very few artists wanted to paint and draw photographs like a photograph you know i think the the notion that that would be what you would do would be sacrilegious it was more about the new you know let's make something new let's take something and let's exaggerate it mm -hmm. you know and i think the exaggeration in the interplay of materials was what brought us modern art yep now and you said you said it before too you know uh as accepted as collage is now, it was, this would have been, looked really odd to people probably when he made it. It was revolutionary. And, um, and it still resonates today. Here, I'm gonna, let me show one more here. This is one of the ones that uh, you had asked to put up. Yeah, this is, um definitely something that I think uh, when you look at it and you think about Romare Bearden and his love of music, music composition and uh, Harlem Renaissance, you know, it's hard to uh, talk about him and his work without, I think, bringing this piece up. And uh, this is a great example. You can see, especially in the stripes on that central figure uh, that we're looking at some painted material mixed in with everything else. Um, it's very, very eclectic. And you know, Matt, uh, there's a style of art that does, it's under-recognized and it's the, the art, uh, it's like folk art and it's the art of quilt making, which not only is in and of itself a valid work, type of work, that I think because of its utilitarian uh, use, people bypassed it for a long, long time. But now it's getting more uh, attention. And to think about um, people in America, African-American descent, uh, if you are uh, living with um, less means, in terms of um, you know monetary uh, quilts become a great way to uh, be able to you know keep warm but also to be artistic and so I think um, there's artistry in quilt making and then when I look at his work I think it pays tribute to something that is is a really big part of uh, the African American heritage in this country, you know, since its inception. Um, and he, br he brings that into his collage. It's yeah. collage, it's quilting. Yeah. And look at the colors on the faces. This is where I'm, I'm going back to uh, um, cubism 
and uh, just like the figure on the left with the blue stripes on his face and then the figure on all the way to the right with uh, the horizontal green and yellows and blues, um, my eye accepts those colors on those faces. I think in part because I get that he's talking about the nature of this person that he's creating here. That is the person's soul. I, I'm just taking a shot at this. This is why, like, I don't even, I don't even really question the guy on the left with the vertical um, stripes, the blue. It, it's, it's an expression of the character, the coloring on the face. Uh, it is the person. And it is, and maybe it is also a mask. Um, but this is the thing about it too. It, again, like I said before, it's allowing me, me as the viewer, to put things together. It's, it allows for play in a way that um, I often, when I'm making my artwork, I want to nail stuff to the wall. I want everything to be fully uh, understandable and, uh, you know, perfectly rendered. And then when I, and seeing work like this, this kind of, um, uh, the word play just keeps coming up. The play in the way that he's rendering things is uh, just delightful to me. You know, he's definitely one of those people that we can learn a lot from when you think about texture and uh, harmony, we think about the use of color and hue and value. And we then we think about the breaking up of space and uh, the figure ground relationship, like all those things come into play. And you know, when I'm working with young artists or beginning artists, sometimes we get too busy in our piece and things become distracting, especially like if we're just talking about a portrait, people try to draw every single strand of hair and then my eye goes to the hair because it's so distracting from the rest of the portrait, the face. And then we need to tone that down. There's so much going on in this piece, but because of his brilliance in the use of hue and value and color and, and all the things that I mentioned earlier, um, everything works. Everything is in harmony. It's, it's a harmony that recognizes that when you are um, living at a time that he was living and growing up in the Harlem Renaissance, um, that's sort of a controlled chaos. I mean, that's really what what music that we call jazz, um, because you can't really can't really harness this thing to its truest sense. You know, uh, jazz. I think what really uh, gets under our skin about it is the fact that um, we never know what's going to happen. You know, and I think in a piece like this, uh, there's there's a tension to some of that sort of controlled chaos right. that I like to call it. Yeah. Well, Eugene, Very cool. yeah. How about if we leave it there? We've come to nearly All a, right. the end of our time. Um, thank you for bringing up Romare. His uh, beard and his work is um, it. You know, I, I'm learning stuff by being here in this environment with you and doing these uh, webcasts. So. Just appreciate. I, I didn't know of his work, so thank you. It, it'll it'll it opens up my eye. Yay! You know? Ah, well, brilliant, and a brilliant uh, discussion. Yeah. And I can't wait to talk yeah. about more art on our next Save World Make Art. Now, and we, Matt's gonna sing us out. With... Yes, he is. I'm talking about myself in the third person. <laughs> That's dangerous, but uh, I do want to say. <laughs> uh, if you haven't noticed yet, what Eugene and I are doing is um, we are using the theme songs to 1960s and 70s television programs to take us on out of here every uh, show. So um, you probably can guess most of them. Hopefully, we're, we're hoping that. But this one is uh, Save World Make Art is the place to be. Make an art life for me. Land spread out so far and wide. Heat Manhattan, just give me that countryside. And give me some Romare beard in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks, Mr. Faulkner. 
Thanks, everybody. We'll see you guys again. New Bye -bye. York is where I'd rather stay. I get allergic smelling hay. I just adore a penthouse <laughs> view. Darling, I love you, but give me Park Avenue. Uh, thanks, Bye, Mr. Falter. Bye.